All right. Hey, listen, but we're here for the word right now, so turn to John 10 for me. Are you ready for the word? Yes. Man, we love the word. So John 10 is our foundational scripture for the series that we're currently in. We're actually wrapping it up. This is installment number three. Uh, we started talking about how do you hear God's voice in the middle of all the noise because there's so much background noise and it's just increasing. The volume outside is increasing. The volume inside is increasing. Uh, but the number one question we get from people and often myself, I'm looking to this as well, is how do you hear from God in the midst of all the noise? How do you know his voice is speaking? How do you know that impression, that dream? And the Bible has a lot to say about it. We've just taken in three weeks, and certainly you can dig in a little deeper on your own. Um, the first week, not to review everything, we talked about having a prepared heart, that you can hear his voice cl uh, more clear, more clearly when your heart is prepared. You can go back and watch that. We're not going to review that. And then last week, we talked about um, the whispers of God. We said that still small voice that you might be familiar with that term, and just looked in the scripture how God speaks, why God speaks, and how he speaks. Uh, today, I want to give you some filters, some tests. How do you know it's God's voice? Because God is speaking. Aren't you glad that God is still speaking today? I, why would we even try and get people in a relationship with God if he doesn't speak to you, no communicate? No one wants to be in a relationship, right? We've been there. People won't talk to you or anything like that. That's not the case with our God. He wants to talk to you all the time. He loves that he has a relationship or can have a relationship with you. So he's speaking. The problem today is not God doesn't have a speaking problem. We have a hearing problem. And the good in that is we can control that. We could change that, right? We just have to do some things according to the word and make sure we're positioning ourselves to hear his voice. John 10, three through five says this, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him or for the shepherd. This is a metaphor Jesus is using to show the relationship he has between himself as the shepherd and you and I as sheep. And sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Listen, he doesn't just call, hey, my sheep, come on. He calls you by name. Hey, the body of Christ, come on. Hey, tree of life, come on. No, no, no. He's calling your name personally. I love that picture. When he has brought out all his own, his own, he goes on ahead of them. He's leading us into our tomorrows, into our days. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. There's safety there. There's security there. There's trust there. But they'll never follow the voice of a stranger. There are so many strange voices today, so many competing voices today that we need to tune him in more and tune those out more. In fact, they'll run away from those because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. Oh, to get to the place that even the world's voice is unrecognizable recognizable to us anymore, right? Or if it is recognizable, we know don't listen to that one, right? We listen to the voice of the shepherd. So we've been talking about that. That's our foundation. I, I want you to know this morning that even the devil has a voice. Yeah, yeah. Right? He spoke to a lot of you already. Like you've already said, why didn't we keep going in praise and worship? No, I'm just kidding. And you're like, what is that about, right? The devil speaks to you even in service, not just on the way, right? Not just on the way, that little fighting moment or whatever and getting ready in the morning of the night before, right? Certainly he's all over that. He speaks and he wants to speak. He wants to distract you. He wants you to listen to his voice. He has a voice. There's a lot of voices out there. We need to know the voice of the Lord and he speaks. He speaks in service. I, I felt him speak to me before. It's typically before service starts. Is I'm here on the front row. All of a sudden, all of a sudden I hear this, like it's like, you know, the picture, like the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder, back and forth kind of thing. And, and he's telling me, he's telling me all the time, like probably every other Sunday at least, he's like, man, your message is terrible. I'm like, I haven't even shared it yet. He goes, I know what it is, right? I'm like, he's like, you didn't study long enough. You didn't pray enough. Who are you to stand up there in front of everybody, right? He, he's telling me that your shirt is wrinkled. You don't match and you need a haircut or whatever. I was like, no. uh, get behind me, Satan, right? And by the way, if, if something just told you that my shirt is too tight, that is a lie from the pit of hell right now. <laughs> A little insecure right now, but anyways, <laughs> it's the devil. He's, he's speaking to me. He's like, who are you to get up there in front of these people? He's, he's speaking to me, tell, reminding me of my insecurities and, and my faults right there. And that's why praise and worship is so important. It helps me just get refocused on and help, it helps me hear the voice of God because at the same time then I'm, I'm trying to tune that out. And at the same time, God's speaking, you're my son. You're my child. You, you, you're, you're, the, you're the pastor here. You're anointed. You're extremely handsome and courageous. And I, I hear all that. It's like, and so I come out. I come out from the curtain then. And, but you got, you got to know which 
voice to listen to. Because I'll be honest with you, it's been several years now, and uh, I was standing there on the front row, and I, 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 I start, it started slowly, and, and I didn't deal with it like it should, and it, and it started just kind of overwhelming me. And honestly, there was a stretch of time, it's been several years, on the front row, I would go through panic attacks before I even got up here. Just overwhelmed with the voice of the enemy. Like I, like I didn't distur- dis- distinguish it or discern it enough, and, and, I, and I didn't listen to the voice of the Lord enough. And there's times I'd, I just would walk out the side during praise and worship and out the side door and there and just trying to get it together again until I was able to find out how to filter that and know what the voice of the Lord is. We all need to, right? We find ourselves that a, a day, and, and there's a lot of us in here that deal with things like that. And, and, I, and I, know what, I know what that feels like, and it's every day I have to, Every Sunday, I have to be there on the front row, and I have to not listen to that voice, but listen to the voice of the Lord. There's voices speaking to us all the time. How do you discern who's speaking? How, how do you discern whose voice that is? Is it, is it uh, yours, even, amongst all the others? And it's important for us to understand that. And we're going to learn today how to recognize God's voice. And I'm going to give you some things in just a moment that I believe will really, and, and so the word is only effective if you apply it. We're not here for information, we're here for transformation, amen? amen? We didn't come just another service. We didn't come to just because it's church or Sunday. We came to have an encounter and experience with the only true and living God. We came to be changed and transformed by being in his presence and hearing his voice speak to us. And, and I, I wanna encourage you this morning to not just to have ears to hear, but then have a commitment to do. And, and it's important for you and I to, to be able to filter this way because honestly, even the best can miss it. So, so I... I have to listen and discern the voice just like you do. I don't have special ears. I have the same filters we'll talk about in a moment because I'm human like you. I, I have a different role and responsibility and calling, but I still have the same ears you have and still have to filter through all that. And, and nobody's perfect. Nobody gets it right all the time. And, and in fact, just a funny story, um, because when we're trying to listen to God, there's gonna be all kinds of things speaking and we'll have to wade through it all. Um, that's just kind of how it goes. And it was several years ago that I, had somebody come up to me and always is a little, makes me a little nervous when someone says, Pastor, I have a word for you. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. The word of the Lord came to me to tell you. And I had a gentleman tell me, this is several years ago. He came up to me and said, Pastor, God told me to tell you that he knows you have a cocaine addiction. <laughs> I'm, like, what? I'm like, are you on it right now? What's that? He says, you're addicted to Coke. I said, well, I drink a lot of Diet Coke, but that doesn't make me an addict. I said, what are you talking about? And they started talking about all the symptoms and how fast I talk and all this stuff. I'm like, this doesn't mean anything. The devil tells me that. It's the only thing he gets right. And it's, it's this moment, I listened to him for a moment. I finally stopped him and said, man, you are way off. You are missing it. And he said, no, God told me to tell you. And he said, and he told me that you would act this way. <laughs> and he said, and here's what he said. He said, and if you don't stand up in front of the congregation and confess it and get help, I will. And I said, well, I have a word for you. <laughs> I said, if you stand up and confess anything, our ushers and security will drag you out behind the building and lay hands on you. I'm laying on of hands, brother. That's my word for you, right? Now, he was, he was sincere in that. I mean, he really felt, I mean, I'll joking, he really felt that. And obviously, he'd listened wrong, and, you know, and, and, but there's some things, I've, I have words that are great words. Like, oh, I want that. But those weren't even for me, right? And so, we have to discern that. No one gets it right. No one's perfect. In fact, in the scripture, our great example is Peter. And, and the disciples were with Jesus and they're talking and all of a sudden Jesus is like, uh, he's like, who do, who do men say that I am? And they respond and he goes, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're, you're Christ the Messiah. And Jesus looks at him and says, only my father could have told you, you had a word from heaven for me in that moment. And then it's not long after that. I mean, minutes later, all of a sudden, Jesus is talking about they're gonna come and take me and kill me. And he's, Peter's like, you're never gonna die. I'll protect you with my life. And Jesus says, get, be, get thee behind me, Satan. You totally me. He went from hero to zero in a couple of minutes. It's like, no one gets it right all the time. That's why we have to learn how to discern the voice of the Lord. And he doesn't want us missing it, so he's given us ways on how we can do that. We're going to talk about that this morning, and 
What does that look like for you and I? But here's where it begins. First John 4, 1. First John 4, 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. You see that spirit's plural. There's the Holy Spirit that we'd like to think we're hearing from all the time, but there's a whole lot out there trying to distract you, to get you off track, to try and discourage you, and certainly the enemy and all kinds of things are happening. So it is appropriate and proper for you and I. Let me say, test everything. When you leave here today, get your live notes out and test everything. We try and give you all scriptural support, but don't take my word for it. Take his word for it. And so uh, Proverbs 14, 12 says this, there is a way that appears right, but in the end it leads to death. It could seem right. You may want it. It makes me happy. But can I tell you this morning, nowhere in the scripture does it ever say God wants to make you happy. I got a bigger amen in first service with less people. I'm just like... are the holy ones. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't take that word. Let that word go. He wants to make you holy. And holiness will lead you to happiness. If you're pursuing happiness, it'll lead you to unholiness. You'll be happy for a moment. So he wants us to discern what's right and wrong. There's a way that may seem right to you, but may not be what he wants for you. And it's important for us to understand that. And so I want to give you four ways, four ways, four ways to test or filters if it's God speaking or not. And let me say this, it's best if we use all four, and you'll understand as we talk through them. Number one, I think is the best one. I I don't know my personal preference. I think they're all important, powerful, necessary. But number one, does it line up with the Bible? Can I tell you how many, I have discussions all the time with people that are telling me God did, said this, said that, and I'm like, show me that in Scripture. Where, where's that in the Bible? I, I, don't, I don't see it in there. Maybe I'm missing it somewhere. And, and here's the thing that we all know. The reality is you can use one Scripture out of the Bible and try and make it support something, but the Bible talks about the entire counsel of God or look at supporting Scriptures and context. And so the Bible will never, let me say, what God speaks to you will never contradict the Bible. And sometimes I have people saying, well, God told me this. I'm like, well, why would he say that? Because it's right here in the scripture this way. And it doesn't make sense to me. And I'm not trying to be ugly or anything. It's amazing that what we can justify, but you can't get outside of the filter of the word of God. If you want to know if it's God or not, it's going to line up with his word. It's not going to contradict it. He does not do that. He does not do it. God's voice will never contradict God's word. Never, ever, 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 ever. And we have to be so careful. And I want to use a a scripture this morning. I'm I'm hesitant to do it. I want you to know my heart in this, but I think it's a, it's, it's powerfully um, expresses what I'm trying to say with this point. Uh, So uh, hang in there with me. So Matthew 19, three says this, some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him. And they asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? I'm not here to discuss that with you this morning, but I want you to hear how Jesus responds. He goes on to say this in verse four. He didn't even answer the question. He said, haven't you read? He says, don't even take my word for it. He's like, and Jesus is the living word. Understand that. He's like, when people come come to me, it's like, hey, you know what? Haven't you read? How about we look in the Bible? You don't even need my opinion. You don't need to know what I think. You need to know what the word says. So even in this exchange, Jesus automatically points them back to scripture. And he said, haven't you read or go find what the word says? Now, having said that, now the Bible also says that, and I just need to finish this out for you. The Bible also says that he hates divorce. Let me make something very clear. He doesn't hate divorced people. He, in fact, his heart breaks for the heartbreak that comes with that. In fact, he hates anything that hurts his kids or causes pain. And he loves divorced people. He wants to restore and to redeem and show you his love and his value. And he has a plan and purpose and destiny for you. So don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say here this morning. Amen. Amen. So what I'm trying to tell you is even in the most difficult of trying to understand whether it's God or not, he says, go look at the word. Go look at it. So let's, let's take it a step farther for, for the point of discussion this morning. Okay. I have people come up to me all the time and ask me, well, what do you think about same-sex marriage? Well, what difference is it? What does it matter that I think what I think? 
What does the word say? Because the word says it's man and a woman. I mean, it's not even on me anymore. And people can call me whatever they want to call me or you whatever they, it's on the word. Oh, what do you think about gender and gender identity? Well, it says he created male and female. That's what his word says. Uh, what is it? What about abortion? Well, I don't want to get in all the details of all that, but I, I see he chooses life. But he redeems all those. Come on, help me out here because I don't want to feel bad. He redeems all that. He restores all that, okay? It's the word of God. Oh, okay, how about this? How about this? Well, why do y'all believe in that tithing? Well, don't take my word. You're going to say that because you're the pastor. No, read the word. We're going to teach on it here soon. We need to because you need to know God's plan. Uh, okay, so how about this one? What about the Holy Spirit thing? And it's in the Bible. And we're going to teach on that too. So you can decide. Don't take my word for it. Take his word. What about healing? He still heals today. We just sang a song. He's Jehovah Rapha. He's a heal. He's a healer. All right. So listen, Jesus is like, in this moment, he's like, hey, don't get, take my word for it. Take the word for it. It's important. And we, we know that in the scripture, when the enemy um, visited Jesus as he was out in the wilderness to be tested, the enemy came and tested him with a word, with a scripture taken out of context. And Jesus' response to the enemy who used the scripture was to bring the full counsel of God and say, in the proper context, the scripture says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So understand that the word is our number one filter, but we need to use all of these. We need to use all of them. Luke 21, 33 says this, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. How serious is God about his word? Everything else can pass away, but one thing will remain. It is his word. I love that. And so we need to make sure that we filter everything through the word of God. Uh, number two, number two filter, will that make me more like Christ? You know, everything God says is to make you more like Christ. So listen, before you send that text, that email, before you post, stop for just one moment and say, will this make me more Christ-like? That right there saved a whole lot of you right there. <laughs> because everything is supposed to make us more Christ-like. That's what he's doing. Everything, he's speaking to us that way. It'll make you more. If I follow through with what I'm feeling, will it make me more like Jesus or less like Jesus? If you want to know. And that is our goal, is to be more and more like Jesus. The more I know God, the more I'll become like him. And then he'll help work on my attitudes, my choices, my thoughts. I may not be where I, I need to be, but I'm thankful I'm not where I was. Amen. And so you need to find those ways that will help you grow in that. Philippians 2.5 says this, uh, in your lives you must think and act like Christ Jesus. That, that's a, I mean, we might think it's silly today, but how powerful back in the day were those bracelets, the WWJD? Maybe we need to bring that back. What would Jesus do or say? Will that make me more Christ-like with what I'm hearing? 2 Corinthians 10.5. 2 Corinthians 10.5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive everything we're hearing, every impression, everything we're feeling to make it line up with Jesus. Does this make me more Christ-like? Everything we're hearing and feeling. And then James 3, 17 through 18. Well, what does that look like, looking more like Jesus? Because maybe I don't really even know. Well, great, he answers it. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. Does it make you more pure? Does it make you more peace-loving? Does it make you more considerate? Does it make you more submissive or serving others? Does it make you full of mercy, full of good fruit, impartial and sincere? Peacemakers who sow in peace reap the harvest of righteousness. Does it make you more like Jesus? If what you're feeling, you're wondering, what is this? Where is this coming from? Well, one of your filters is, does it make you more like Jesus? Number three, does godly counsel agree? Let me emphasize godly counsel. And let me say it this way, when it says, does godly counsel agree? Not does godly counsel agree with you. <laughs> because you can talk to enough godly people 
somebody's going to support you in your craziness, right? And we just say that, whatever, I don't, no, I, I didn't mean that. I'm talking about trusted, proven people that walk with Jesus, that maybe going back to number one and number two, like looking and, and know, are familiar with the scripture, and number two, are doing the best they can to look like Jesus. Can you find a couple of people, maybe even go to you know, the people at the church in your small group, and can you find people that agree, not with you, but agree together on that? Because you can always find somebody to agree with you. But can godly counsel agree together with what you're sharing them that you're hearing or feeling or an impression that you have? And if not, don't do it. Look for agreement. There is power in agreement. And I have godly people in my life that I test things with all the time, all the time. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of the fool seems right to them, but the wise to listen to advice. Godly counsel. Proverbs 19, 20 through 21. Listen to advice and accept discipline. That means you're not always gonna like it. But if it's godly counsel in agreement, not with you, but with each other, then you need to listen and it's gonna probably go against what you want. That's where the discipline comes in. Uh, and then at the end, you will be counted among the wise. Many are the plans of a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. There's a lot of things you wanna do and a lot of godly counsel in agreement may go against what you're doing, but the Bible says that's wise to listen and it will help you. Important. Proverbs 24, six says this. Surely you need guidance to wage war and victory is won through many advisors. Again, the caveat here is godly counsel because we can always find people that will agree with us. Hey, listen, we know who to go to for our crazy ideas, right? And we know not to, who to go to because <laughs> that person's gonna tell us, no, I'm not going there, right? But listen, we need to allow the filter to be working um, to help us understand what God's speaking and saying. If you don't get agreement in godly counsel, stop. Don't do it. Last one, do I have peace? This is a powerful one. Do I have peace in this moment? You know what's different about what we believe and all other beliefs? We don't just worship God, we have God in us. God on the inside. That's why we can have peace in the midst of a storm. Everything on the outside can be going crazy. But on the inside, and people look at you and say, why are you so calm right now? Isn't this, this is, this is impacting me. Why isn't it impacting you? I just got peace on the inside because it doesn't come from the world, it comes from God. The Holy Spirit in me. And he'll lead you in the midst of peace. The peace that passes understanding, which means I don't even know why I shouldn't even be having peace right now, but it's because of what is happening on the inside of me through God, listening to God's voice. The Bible also says that Jesus says, I don't, I don't give peace like the world gives. It's different. You're not gonna find the God kind of peace like the world finds peace. So when we're talking peace, understand it's different. It's different than circumstances lining up. It's different than people agreeing with. It's different on the inside. It's different. And it's that still small voice speaking to you. So it's important for you and I to find and follow after peace. And there's been times, you know, you've made decisions and it's just like, hmm, is that on the inside? That's your spirit going one way and God's spirit going the other way. And you need to redirect and get to that place of peace. And we have to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit because he speaks 1 Corinthians 14, says this, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches and saints, meaning he wants you to follow after peace. Okay, how do we do it? Philippians 4, six through seven. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer, nothing happens without prayer. Prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and when you do that, the peace of God, say peace of God, peace of God, not the world's kind of peace, which is fleeting and based on circumstances, which transcends all understanding. It doesn't make sense. I have peace right now. It will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Familiarity with the shepherd, that word guard there is a military term. If you look it up in the Greek, it literally means a garrison or army. God is so concerned or into you having peace. He's going to send an army to guard peace in your heart and your mind. Because he wants you to have peace. Peace comes from listening to his voice, following him. 
You know, the hard thing about wrapping up a series is wrapping up a series. <laughs> oh, I could go again. I could go another thing. But I want to I leave some things that, with you, hopefully tie this all together. I just gave you those four filters, and I would say, again, use all four in every decision. Don't pick and choose. They'll all support each other, and they'll help you filter it even better. But here's what I want to say. Connect with God every day. You, you have to be familiar with his voice. If my wife was to call me and I pick up the phone and I don't look at caller ID and I say, hello, and she says, hi, I know it's my wife. If you call me and I pick up the phone, I'm going to say, why do you have my number? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and you say, hi, who is this? I, say, I know her voice because we talk every day. How familiar are you with the shepherd's voice? I'm telling you, connect. We have to hear him. Connect with him every single day. If you got to get up earlier, five minutes, 10 minutes, it is worth it so you can hear him. You got to be familiar with the voice of the shepherd. You determine how familiar you are with how much time. It's, uh, it's, it's not complicated. The more familiar, the, the voices you know best are the ones you spend the most time with. So you got to be familiar with him. You got to be familiar with his voice. And let me say this too, you gotta be in the word, but don't read the Bible just to read the Bible. Read the Bible to connect with God. My goal is not to get through my devotional chapter or my devotional verses today. My goal is to connect with God. Whether it's 10 verses, a chapter, or one verse, my goal is to connect with God. I can connect with God over one phrase and one verse, and I cannot connect with him over a whole chapter. What are you looking for? I'm looking for God in everything I read. I'm looking for the voice of God in everything I'm reading, putting inside of me. So don't just fulfill some obligation. Read to connect with God. I, I want to say it this way. Tune him in more. Get more familiar with his voice. Let me say this too. The other side of that is tune out the world more. You know what that means for some of us? Stop listening to some of the stuff you're listening to. You're, you're allowing all this other noise in some things. Quit binging Netflix. Get off social media more. Don't listen to the news all day. Right? The music, whatever it is, you, you know the noise in your life that you're allowing in. There's so much of that we shouldn't even be listening to or entertaining. It's clouding our ability to hear God's voice. You need to tune him in, but you need to turn more, tune more of the world out. And can I just take another step, and I know you'll love me, I'm already on the edge already today, so. There's some people voices you need to tune out. There it is. But they're my best friend. Are they really? <laughs> Are they giving you the word? Are they telling you to be more like Jesus? Come on. Let's fil let's, we got to filter their voice the same way. There's some voices we've been listening to that are not godly counsel. That even though they may, you may think they want your best, they don't know what God knows. But what might seem right to man or your happiness may not be. God may be more about his plan and holiness. So we just need, there's some voices we need to tune out if you really are serious about hearing God's voice. And let me say this, my last comment on that. Take steps towards God and what he's already spoken. Let me just say this right now to all of you here. And you're, if you're a parent, you'll understand this. When your kids come into you and want something, you say, you didn't even do what I told you to do the last time. And we want to go to God and God tell us something when we haven't even done what he told us to do before. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know God's up there saying, you didn't even do the last thing I told you. You didn't do the last 10 things, 15 things. <laughs> but we're that way. So if you want God to speak to you, make sure you're doing what he's telling you to do. Because remember, we're not just to be hearers of the word only. We're to be doers. It's the application of the word that brings the presence and power of God active in our life. Amen. It's the application that brings transformation. It's not the information that brings transformation. It's the application. So we need to understand that.